there are four market structures that you need to be familiar with. We've looked at perfect competition, we've looked at monopolistic competition, and in chapter 11 of, of your textbook, you look at monopoly and oligopoly. So there's another slide set for monopoly, you can check that out. Oligopoly is going to be the most different from the other market structures. With oligopoly, we have a few firms who are dominating the market, and we're going to use a little bit different tools to think about oligopolis incentive to produce and pricing and all of that. So typically we see firms produce until marginal revenue is just equal to marginal cost. Uh, that's That's been our rule through monopoly, through monopolistic competition, even perfect competition. With perfect competition we have the special case we can just say price equals marginal cost. Here with oligopoly we have a small number of interdependent firms. That's going to be a key idea. The firms here are interdependent. They're their actions, their strategies affect one another. So uh, we'll take a look at what oligopolists are before we look at what actually they do, how they can how they compete. So oligopolists are large. It's a large, small number of firms that dominate the market. Their actions have an effect on one another. That's the interdependence. And there are barriers to entry here, just like we had in Monopoly. So oligopoly, small number of firms that are large and dominate the market. One way we could get at what exactly what firms we're talking about is to use a four firm concentration ratio. So this is just the fraction of an industry's overall sales that is accounted for by its four largest firms. So the four largest firms in a particular industry. So in general we're thinking about a ratio, a four firm concentra concentration ratio larger than 40% that would typically indicate an oligopoly. So here are some examples of the four firm concentration ratio. The sales of the top four firms as a percentage of the uh, industry as a whole. And you see we have different, these are the different industries labeled here with a couple of examples. Concentration ratios aren't perfect. They give us some general idea about where there might be an oligopoly. There are some weaknesses with this concentration ratio, using that as a tool, as a guide. Um, the concentration ratios don't include exports from foreign countries to the United States. So goods and services that are produced in foreign countries exported in the United States, they don't show up here. The concentration ratios also are calculated at the national level. So even if the market is local, like the FSU bookstore, we're looking at the national level. So that's not exactly a perfect measurement there. And then even defining the market within the, each industry is, is difficult. So Walmart and BJ's is like a Costco or a Sam's. So they aren't exactly in the same market, um, but they probably compete against each other to some extent. So you should have some idea of what we're talking about when we say oligopoly, what kind of firms, what kind of industries are we looking at, the, the auto industry, all those examples on the last page. There are a few firms that dominate the market. Why do oligopolies exist? This is going to be similar to what we looked at with Monopoly. It's because of barriers to entry, things that keep new firms from entering the market. A similar thing that we saw with Monopoly here is economies of scale. So with economy of scale, that was in Monopoly, that would lead to a natural monopoly. So that uh, as output continued to expand, average total costs fell until there was just one firm to, who was able to dominate the market. Here with oligopoly, we're thinking the same thing, except now it's just going to be dominated by a few firms instead of a single firm. So here you see, this is exactly what I was talking about with economies of scale. When we think competitive, it's normally a, a smaller output, so there, that would give us a lot of firms that we reach the lowest point on the long-run average cost curve. Versus oligopoly, it's going to continue to climb. The long-run average cost continues to decline until we get a, a larger quantity. So that's going to allow just a few firms to exist in the market. So why do monopolies exist? Economies of scale, ownership of a key input. This is just like what we saw in Monopoly. Ownership of key input shouldn't be anything new here. Also, like what we saw under Monopoly, uh, government ex granted exclusive rights can give rise to barriers to entry, leading to an oligopoly. With Monopoly, it was exclusive right given to one firm. Here with oligopoly, we're thinking it's given to an industry or to a small number of firms. So uh, the key probably example here would be licensing for dentists and doctors. Like I alluded to earlier, the tools that we're going to use for studying oligopoly are going to be different for what we use, than what we used for mon monopolistic competition and perfect competition. We can't um, use those same tools because with oligopoly we have a large 
uh, large firms, so a small number of firms that are large, whose actions really impact one another. So what we have is actually strategic interdependence. There, there, there is a strategy involved, and the actions of one firm affects the other uh, pretty significantly. So when we go forward with oligopoly, we're going to be thinking game theory, which is just that study of that strategic interdependence. So there are sit firms are making decisions and they're uh, to try to attain their goals, but the, the outcome reaching those goals depends on what others are doing. So this is going to be why we want to think about game theory with oligopoly. So with games, these are the, the basic ideas that go along with a game, in quotation marks there. There are going to be rules that determine what's, what's allowable and what's not. Players can employ strategies to reach their objectives. And then as a result of a, a particular player's strategies and the other player's strategies, each, each player, each firm, uh, receives payoffs. So here, with the payoffs, this is where, of course, we're going to see interdependence here because one firm's actions affect another firm. So I'm kind of merging the discussion of game theory with the exact way that we're going to be using it and talking about firms as players. So that's that's kind of what's going on here. So the, the rules in our oligopoly game are going to be the production functions and the market demand curve. The strategies will be how what firms choose to produce, and the payoffs is just the firm's profit. To give you an example of how this might work, let's look at a duopoly game. So duo just meaning two, so we have two firms. Imagine we just have Spotify and Apple. They are the only two firms selling a streaming music service. So each firm is going to have to choose their strategy, um, actions that they're, going to, they're taking to achieve their goal, which of course is going to be still maximizing profits. They're just going to maximize profits in a different way than we've looked at before. So let's say each firm can either charge $14.99 or $9.99. So you see that here with Spotify. Spotify can charge $9.99 or $14.99. Same with Apple, $14.99, $9.99. Those are their two options. They're two strategies. So in each of these uh, boxes here, we see the payoff matrix. So uh, the way to read this is if Spotify charges $14.99 and Apple does too, Spotify gets $10 million, Apple gets $10 million. Spotify charges $14.99 and Apple charges $9.99, Spotify gets $5, Apple gets $15. So that's, that's how you'll read each, each of those boxes. And you see how the one firm's action affects the other firm. Because right now the, the firms are choosing their strategy simultaneously. So uh, whether Spotify chooses $9.99 or $14.99 affects what Apple is going to earn. Just as Apple's own actions affects what Apple would earn. So let's say you're Spotify in this game. How would you play? Okay, this would be a little bit easier for me to show you if I could actually cover my uh, use my hand to cover the screen. So if you're Spotify... Cover the $9.99 under Apple with your right hand. So now you're just looking at the left column. Um, that's the way That's the way we're going to look at this. So if Apple is choosing $14.99, what's Spotify's best bet going to be? They're going to want to choose $9.99 to earn that $15 million profit. Okay, so there's the $15 million. Now, if Apple instead is choosing $9.99, what would Spotify's best option be? So cover $14.99 for Apple now with your left hand. Now Spotify is looking at 5 or 7.5. So again, they're going to choose the bottom. So no matter what Apple does, Spotify is better off choosing $9.99. Uh, they're going to earn $15 million, which is better than the 10, or they're going to earn $7.5, which is better than the 5. So because no matter what Apple does, Spotify always chooses $9.99. That is a dominant strategy for Spotify. It's, it's the uh, best strategy no matter what Apple does. Now let's do the same thing with Apple. If you're Apple, how would you play? Now the way to do this again is to cover, uh, this time we're going to cover the rows. So first let's cover the $9.99 row for Spotify. So cover the bottom row. Now, if Spotify is playing $14.99, what is the best thing for Apple to do? They're going to go to $15 million. So Apple would choose $9.99. Okay. Now, if Spotify chooses $9.99, what would be best for Apple? So cover the top row with your hand. And if Spotify chooses $9.99, Apple can either get $5 or $7.5 million in profit. So they're going to go for the $7.5 million. 
So Apple chooses $9.99. So again, in either case, choosing $9.99 is a dominant strategy for Apple. Now this just depends on how exactly the payoffs are laid out, right? So there are various different scenarios, but this is this would be the, the way you would work through this particular game. So both firms charging $9.99 is a Nash equilibrium. So this is both firms are choosing the best strategy given the strategy chosen by the other firms. And there's not going to be any incentive for either firm to deviate from playing that, that, those dominant strategies. It doesn't have to be dominant strategies for there to be a Nash equilibrium. With Nash equilibrium, we're just thinking best response to the other person's strategy. You might be wondering, okay, both of them are ending up at 7.5 million. That's great. So that's a Nash equilibrium. Um, but what about, why don't they just both charge $14.99? They both earn $10 million in profit. Why would that not happen? And that very well may happen. If they did that, if the firms cooperated with one another and charged $14.99, both of them, that would be called collusion. So far, firms are just agreeing to change the charge the same price, um, like price fixing, or to somehow limit their competition. So if they were to do that, they would in fact earn more profit than just acting independently. But collusion is against the law in the United States. Um, but you can see why firms might be tempted to collude because they would earn higher profits. You won't have to solve any of these games like this on your quiz or your exam. I just want I just wanted to go through this so you get an example, so you could have a little bit better understanding of why what we're talking about when we're saying strategic uh, interdependence. So. Actions, uh, Apple's actions affect what Spotify is going to receive, and Spotify choices will affect what Apple, the payoff Apple receives, right? So there are a lot of different game types. Um, the firms could, it could be a repeated game. Spotify and Apple could play this game over and over and over again. So that would change things a little bit. It could be a, um, this was a simultaneous choice. It could be that one firm makes a choice and then the other firm has to respond. So there are a lot of different game types that would be applicable depending on the exact situation that we're trying to model. If you continue on in economics, uh, you'll see plenty more of this. Uh, I would expect to see even more of it, even in just taking intermediate micro. And then as you go on, um, there's, there'll, you'll, you can just take an undergraduate class on game theory. And of course, as you go on farther than that, there'll be more than that. Um, so, but it is a helpful tool for modeling these, at these situations of strategic interdependence. As far as what you need to know for the uh, for the quizzes and for the final, I would pay careful attention to the key terms and um, everything in chapter 11 of your textbook. That that gives you a good idea of the kind of questions and the kind of information that you need to be responsible for. So with ol oligopoly, you need I would say um, know the definitions, know what the market structure looks like, be able to find terms like collusion, uh, price leadership, all of those key terms that you'll see in that chapter.